Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ryan Leary from Recruiting Daily. Welcome uh, to our webinar today, the HR Tech Stack, Build the Case, Get the Buy-in, and Get What You Want. We've got two phenomenal presenters uh, today that we'll introduce in just a moment. We're going to hang tight and give it uh, another 10 or 15 seconds and let people uh, continue to log into the session. Right. Before we get started, I want to go through a couple of key housekeeping items here, and this is just how you can use uh, the system today. Uh, so on the right-hand side of your screen, you're going to see all of your uh, options there to ask questions, the chat box, and of course your audio options. If you uh, prefer to use a telephone, go ahead and select telephone. If you prefer to use your mic and speakers, you can go ahead and click on mic and speakers. If you are dialing in on your phone, make sure you enter your audio pin uh, so that we can track your questions and make sure that we get the proper uh, answer to you. This webinar is, of course, being recorded, and all of the slides will be made available uh, to everybody uh, after the session. Uh, normally, within the next uh, 24 hours, you can find those on recruitingwebinars.com, and uh, we'll also make sure that we are sending uh, the information out to everybody. Uh, after the webinar. Uh, so before we get started, uh, let's just give uh, acknowledgement to where we, we need to, and that is with our support and our sponsor today, uh, with Lever, a uh, great partner of ours. We've been working with them for quite some time now, put on some great events, and so thank you uh, to the team at Lever uh, for making this uh, available for everybody. And of course, our two presenters today, uh, the world knows Jason Seiden. He's recently joined Lever as a head of strategic development, uh, and and so I'll let um, he's gonna he's gonna host the webinar today along with Mike Podobnik, who's the head of talent at Medallia. Uh, head he's the head of global talent acquisition at Medallia, uh, which is a technology company that provides SaaS-based customer experience management. They are the magic behind everything customer experience uh, for their clients. Uh, so with that, Jason, uh, welcome to the call. I'm going to pass everything over to you. And uh, again, guys, if you have questions for everybody on the call, make sure you're entering them into the question and answer panel. We will take all relevant questions during the event itself. Uh, and anything we don't answer during the time of the uh, webinar, we will answer right after the webinar. So make sure you stick around for that as well. Jason, it's all yours. Uh, thanks, Ryan. And uh, hey, Mike, welcome. Welcome. Uh, Good to be talking with you today. Thank you, Jason. So, all right, I'm I'm jumping. I'm looking to jump forward. Ryan, can you can you take us one forward, please? Thank you. Uh, for those of you listening in, some of you have questions. Ryan covered that. Uh, for the rest of you, as you hear the brilliant stuff that Mike has to say, or questions that you love, tweet them out at Lever at Medallia, uh, hashtag with our daily, so we can pick that up online and we can invite the world to to share in the joy. Um, obviously, if there's something you uh, you don't like, you know that's direct message was made for that. Let's let's keep it friendly today. Uh, but I'm I'm looking to dive in. I'm looking. I'm excited to get into this. And, and let's um, let's go one forward just so people can see what the agenda is. Uh, we'll get to this in a second, Mike. You and I both know people are going to read this while we're talking. So let me start with you and who we're talking to. Uh, we know that you're the, the head of global talent acquisition at Medallia, but I'm more interested, before we even get into that, just tell me something about you. Tell me something interesting that you've done in the last month. What in do you the do last month? Yes. Um, I just got back from Hawaii, actually. My uh, fiance is a twin and was fortunate enough to officiate her own twin sister's wedding. So we got to uh, enjoy Oahu and um, uh, watch That's a little special. ceremony. That is fantastic. So your fiance just married her sister. So, so your sister and her twin sister were both fiancés at the same time. So they both got engaged roughly at the same time. <laughs> yeah, just about. So we uh, we were very tempted to elope just before the wedding so that she could finish first. <laughs> you know, that competition amongst twins. Uh, but we we thought it may may not fly as well as. That's fantastic. How was Hawaii? 
It was beautiful. Yeah, so we, all yeah, but all of us. Right, we all know the answer to that question. All right, so um, all right, so uh, if there, I don't know how many people are on the webinar right now, but I do know that there's probably an even ratio of people just like cursing you through their screams. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, it was real tough to come back. Uh, all right, well then we're going to dive right into the webinar because that just kind of took the cake in terms of um, human interest. That congratulations uh, you. on your engagement and uh, and on the the expanding family. That sounds that sounds awesome. Uh, Bringing it back to a little bit more of the mundane, you know, we've got this topic that we're going to talk about today in terms of the HR tech stack, and it's a it's a big topic. Um, I thought before we dive in and, and break it down, and, and you can see kind of how I've been thinking about this. Like, I just wanted to start off with a basic question, which is, uh, for somebody who's thinking about a, a a TA tech stack, what are the core elements? Like, what are the have to haves, and are there some pieces around that that you say, all right, you know, you don't have to have this, but in your experience, this uh, this really makes for a a, a good add on. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. I mean, of course, we all know that ATS is imperative, right? And at the end of the day, in most cases, I think you see the ATS as a process workflow only. Second to that is the HRAS. When we think of what happens. Uh, Mike, you just cut out on us. We'll give you a second to come on back. Everything was great in rehearsal. All right, so while we're waiting for Mike to come on back and uh, and get his audio in here, um, we'll get the we'll get the <coughs> rest of the story on the the kind of the core stack. And for those who are listening and, and waiting for Mike to come back, here's where, here's where we're going to go. Um, once we understand kind of what's in the stack, and I doubt there'll be many surprises with that, uh, Mike and I are going to dive into what does it take to bring a, uh, an HR technology uh, stack to life? And, you know, and, and starting with the very basics, like how do, you, how do you get the right one implemented? So prior to the webinar, I reached out to a handful of folks who I know uh, who are leaders in the space. And, uh, and these are folks at different levels. I reached out to uh, TA leaders. I reached out to some executives. I reached out to HR business partners, people who are stakeholders in the process. And I asked all of them, uh, what do they, what do they really uh, care about? Like kind of how do they think about the questions of implementing HR technology? And, and once, um, once I got their answers back, I noticed a pattern starting to form. So I took the kind of the, the front runners of the answers that I got back <clears throat> and then pinged a larger group and said, okay, uh, which of these is most important? And you can see how people responded to my questionnaire here. Just over half of people uh, wanted to know, all right, how do leading companies think about HR tech ROI? And I'm assuming that we'll get, oh, there we go. All right, so Mike's back. All right, so I'm just going to finish up the agenda. That's okay. I'm just kind of taking through the, the agenda, and then we'll come back. I'll bring you back in. Uh, so just over half the people who I polled wanted to know, all right, how do the leading companies think about ROI? Like how, do you, how do you make an apples-to-apples -apples comparisons when you've got elements of HR technology that sort of overlap with others and the functionality is not quite the same? Um, a lot of people, this third, this middle group, how do, should I maximize the tech I have or should I start fresh? This wasn't quite as big as the ROI question, but it was loud. When I got those polling questions back, anybody who had a comment came from this bucket. So uh, about a third of the people were interested in, you know, how do I make the case or how do I make a decision about this? But the people who are living here are really hurting. <laughs> They're looking for answers. So we're going to dive into that uh, uh, hard. And then this third part is really interesting. How do I close the gap between talent acquisition and executive leadership? The 13% of people who responded that that was important, interestingly, were not practitioners or corporate leaders. They were universally consultants and vendors who commented, I have this bird's eye view of what's going on. I'm being called in to bridge this, this gap between how TA leaders think about tech and how the executives think about tech. And I don't think they're even aware that there is a gap. And it was interesting that it, it, it played out with this poll that people inside of companies just did not pick that. Um, all right, so Mike, I brought people up to speed and kind of like how we're thinking about the HR tech, but let's get back to what you were saying. Uh, we've got the, these core elements of the ATS and the HRIS. Uh, what else do you want in that, in that TA stack? 
It's a great question. I'm sorry to cut out there for a minute. Um, I think the thing that's neglected most frequently is the idea of a CRM. When I look at how much time, effort, and energy it takes to find, recruit, and continue to nurture great talent, it's a huge missing piece. We do that through LinkedIn projects and spreadsheets and just culling through email, but very rarely do we actually archive that and access it uh, across the board. When we mapped out at Medallia, like what is our end-to-end -end process and where do we find big, big time sucks? What was amazing is we had huge opportunity to look beyond the core fundamentals of the stack, look at um, you know, bits and pieces that tied in that helped enable what we needed at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So was there, yeah, what kind of what, from, a, from an enablement standpoint, what are some of those, those features, the spot solutions, those enhancements that, that you said, hey, these are, these are huge efficiency uh, yeah, so, to, to call out one in particular, the idea of e-signature, right? So when we actually looked at the moment that matters when a candidate receives an offer, an invitation to join Medallia, the takeaway is our team was actually going through 18 distinct steps to be able to enter information into our ATS, populate an offer letter, share that with the candidate, and be able to pull it back into the system. And so looking at something small like how do we actually digitize that and move into an e-signature, actually move from 18 steps to two. And when we think about the time back and where we can take the administrative burden off of the team, it was a massive benefit for the point that Medallia was in. That's, um, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's huge. I think, you know, when we, when I think about efficiency, I think about uh, searching capability inside of an ATS. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about the workflow of a of a CRM, um, and you know, the, you know something as as simple as having a, a uh, an email campaign that automatically stops when a candidate responds. Yeah. Uh, but you know, to think about the back end of it, the the electronic signature, uh, you know, I imagine that depending on how a company is recruiting, that one is universal. And then I'm imagining that type of analysis, like 18 steps to two, I could probably do that for anything that's critical to my company mm -hmm. in the recruiting process whether it's yeah. you know, sourcing candidates, referrals, uh, search, like whatever it is, what, what I picked up on is you guys had actually done the work to identify how long it took uh, and then went from there. Yeah, absolutely. We have an amazing team that's come together to really map out the end-to-end -end candidate journey. And to your point, um, I think what we looked at over time is as Medallia grew, we spent a lot of time, probably I would say too much time at the bottom of the funnel. Um, and that's natural, but stepping away and looking objectively at our overall process and then how we actually engage at the top of the funnel in a different way allowed us to really extrapolate out and say, what is it that we need to do better to do different? Can you, uh, clarify, can you clarify what you mean by the bottom and top of the funnel? Absolutely. So when I think about bottom and top of the funnel, so when we looked at the uh, assessment, the candidate experience, and the close, that's generally speaking where we spent our time. Um, so as Medallia grew, we spent a lot of time um, focused on, well, how do we train? How do we know that we're interviewing appropriately? How do we set up our scorecards? But it really was process driven. Um, there's, to your point, so much effort that goes into uh, engaging, identifying, engaging, nurturing candidates along the way that we really just neglected that as we grew. So every time that we had to fill a position, we were really going back to market again and again and again and again. But in all reality, we had a great pool of candidates already in our ATS, but at no point were we engaging them on a regular basis. And so we'd be able to step back and identify communities or groups of talent that we wanted to nurture over time. Um, we could keep a warm pool of talent for positions that we knew were core and common and we would always have a need for. So there was no need to step back to market every single time that we opened a role. Okay, so so here's I think that's I think that's awesome, and I want to I want to do a couple things. The first thing I want to do is I want to assume for a moment that the talent acquisition leaders listening here are they're nodding their heads and they're going, okay, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know uh, that we we get this. Like we see some opportunities for ourselves for our candidates. Excuse me. We need we need to get better at executing those solutions and, and getting the company's buy-in and moving from this this frustration of like we know we can be doing better to this you know this moment of ah like we're actually <laughs> doing better mm -hmm. so uh, so we're starting to put some structure around this discussion we're going to hit these three topics I want to I want to kind of use what you just said as the foundation I want to dive into it by getting into these three questions around like how did you guys think about ROI and you know how'd you make this build or buy uh, 
decision? And then, you know, how do you close these gaps and start building the alliances you need? Uh, Ryan, can you take us forward one slide? Uh, as we go through, just as an aside for folks who are listening, our goal for you is that these four bullets kind of come through the conversation. I don't know if we're going to hit these directly, but my hope is, is that when we're done with the webinar in about 45 minutes, you'll be a little bit smarter about how to engage vendors um, and, uh, you know, to, to help you kind of think about what's possible and kind of what your stack could be, how to build trust with your executives so that when you do your analysis, whether it's 18 steps for a signature uh, or whatever it is, that analysis is taken seriously and it, it becomes part of the decision-making uh, process. Uh, I want to make sure that, uh, well, I'm hoping that we also kind of emphasize the point of like why you're probably not going to be able to get this done alone and, uh, and where those allies in your business are who you're going to need to, uh, to get the tech that you're going to want. And then finally, uh, you know, kind of what goes into a business case. So these are all hip pocket. I have them on a, on a note card in front of me. Um, I'll try and make sure that we get to these through the discussion. Uh, but with that aside done, Ryan, let's jump to, right into it. And Mike, let's get into the, uh, to the very first thing. It, so you're looking at this, you know the core elements of the stack. You've got your ATS, you've got your HRIS, the overlooked elements of the CRM. You're thinking about efficiency. Wait, wait, how did you even think to do a, a step analysis on what goes into a signature? Like, how did you figure out like what you should be measuring? Where did that come from? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like, what was it? What does that process yeah. start? Right. This is this is the stuff that I end up nerding out over. Um, no, in all in all honesty, it really was listening to our team. We anecdotal, anecdotally knew where we felt pain points, but we didn't necessarily dive in deep to understand. Okay, what does that look like? How do we capture time? Um, how do we think about what that takes away from from our business as we grow? And the reality is. Medallia, like a lot of companies, is moving out of the hypergrowth stage. We've moved from 100 to 1,000 in an incredibly rapid time period. You think about the journey from 1,000 to 3,000 or 5,000, and it has to look different. And it's just not possible to ask the team to do more with less all of the time. We'll always work on evolving skills or growing or upskilling, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but there are points where we have to address the tools, the process, the procedures that enable us to get the job done. Okay, wait, but I want to dive into that because yeah. you bring up this, this is a moment in time when Medallia said, okay, we need to take stock and do things differently. And I think the idea of an inflection point in the business is a universal. It may not be because a company is moving out of hyper growth, but it will, the, the idea that we have to make a change comes because whatever you were doing isn't working. But, mm -hmm. but you've got a whole bunch of people who are used to doing it one way. And and I don't mean that negatively. I just mean there's a certain level of intuition that's crept in. Yeah. Uh, right, like I, I'm a skier, I mean, I, and there's no place on that mountain I can't go. I've done the private lessons. I've lived in Colorado. Like I, like, tree doesn't matter. You put me on a snowboard. Like I, I all of a sudden <laughs> that blue run is steeper than any. I don't yeah. want to be on a snowboard. I don't want to deal with that learning curve. And yeah. so, you know, so you've got people, and I can't even tell you like where the intuition around skiing is for me. So when you hit that inflection point, how do you even get people to say, uh, like literally, how do you get them yeah. to start coming in and then, and then looking uh, purposefully at things that they probably can't even articulate how they do it because it's, it's intuitive to them? How do you, you know, it's a, how do you it's manage a, that? It's a great question. And I think this was one of my biggest learnings as a leader coming in and, and leading at a point of inflection. And to be clear, organizations will go through inflection points multiple times as they scale. Um, but what I recognized in moving from a point where things had worked really well, but largely through brute force and really smart people who just wanted to get the job done, um, I felt like, um, imagine for a minute that I was describing a platypus to you and the only thing that you had ever seen was a duck. And you look at me like I'm crazy because of course you know I'm talking about a duck, I just can't describe it. Um, I, I had to really work on refining my storytelling and being able to show someone, hey, this is a pain point. This is something you've articulated, you felt, you know it's difficult. Here's how we make it easier for you. Here's how we enable you to get the job done in a different way or better. Um, I, will, I will tell you, uh, in my time, I have yet to meet anyone who loves the administrative component of recruiting. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the burden that you carry to, to go through the, the great fun parts. 
And so the more that we can minimize that and lift the burden off of the team, the more they respond. Who's involved? It, you know, you talk about you talk about you know going to the team and saying, well, hey, well, mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna we're gonna solve this. Um, you know, did you did you start just by doing an analysis of what the process actually looked like? Did you use was this uh, by TA for TA? Did you pull in business process partners or some anybody from accounting to help with the analysis? Like, what did the what did that measuring process really look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So interestingly enough, first and foremost, we actually built a team. Um, generally speaking, we didn't have a, I would say, a mature or evolved operations function here. We had great leaders who ran the ops component, but not necessarily functional experts who lived through scale, who'd seen this. And so we actually went out and helped uh, or recruited um, leaders in to help us grow. Um, and that was a starting point. So working with the leadership team to really paint the picture of what is is it that we're signing up for this year? What is the next one, two, three, four year journey at Medallia look like for talent acquisition? What we recognized is we can see the headcount growth. And we know that, that generally speaking, our own headcount isn't increasing at the same magnitude, which means we've got to get more efficient, more effective, better at what we do. So some of our focus involves, again, and training and upskilling. Mm -hmm. um, but a big piece of it is how do we unwind the job and make it easier to do? So we started first with talent acquisition. From there, we leaned over to our HR partners. We think about how we connect the pieces between candidate and new hire. Um, and then we started to look out uh, to the system as a whole. And by that, I mean, uh, to your point, the business, business process partners. So I think about IT, I think about finance, I think about all of the people that talent acquisition enacts with and engages in, uh, or, or engages with, um, in how we think about painting a picture of what scale looks like. Hmm. And does that, so as you think about, as you think about what scale looks like, there's implications both for talent acquisition mm -hmm. and then there's implications for the business. Uh, how, what was the ratio of how much of that was about TA being more efficient and how much of that, what ratio was, was devoted to making sure that TA was supporting the business so that the business was as efficient and as effective as possible? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it was probably 50-50. But the reality is what we look to to be able to storytell or to, to walk uh, the business through this were shared and common problems. We knew that workforce planning, for instance, is a huge pain point for us. When we look at, well, how do we need to grow? How do we make sure that we're targeting the right positions? Do we know that there's actually a headcount and budget behind them? And in fact, when that's identified, can we easily articulate what the pipeline looks like or even what the talent pool looks like? And mm -hmm. we found that this is a really convoluted conversation that everyone, I mean, again, top to bottom, from talent acquisition to our HR partners to finance to uh, our, our hiring leaders, all spend an overwhelming amount of time trying to work through. Yeah. So we use that as one of the primary uh, focal points of how do we make this better? How do we make this one step um, substantially better and give time back with clarity and uh, data that has integrity behind it. You know, I, I love that. I, I was asked, uh, look, I, I'm with, an, uh, with Lever and I got asked by somebody, you know, well, will this make my talent team, uh, you know, my, my recruiters and sourcers 10 times more efficient? My answer was, who cares? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you know, like, if you're bringing the right people into the organization and you're, you're engaging your hiring managers and you're changing the trajectory and the velocity of your business results. The idea is to get the right people in so you can, you can make your business 10 times better. So I, I love the fact that there's a strategic element to what you're talking about where you're looking at pain points that talent may control but that have a downstream impact that is universally felt across the business. 100%. What, um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we, we all get in our we all get in our, our silos, and, and I know at the end of the day there there are always metrics that are you know job specific, department specific. What was the highest uh, the highest level ROI metric that uh, that the talent acquisition technology was attached to as you went through this? Right? What, at the end of the day, was there a if we if we're more efficient in talent, we should be more profitable? or you know, we'll be able to hire more salespeople and it's attached to revenue, or did it kind of roll up maybe to not quite that far, but um, you know, an efficiency metric, an operational efficiency metric, or, or it was the highest level ROI metric just kind of still confined to recruiting, even though you knew that you were gonna have these downstream impacts? 
Sorry, just going to cut out for just a minute. Can you see that one more time? <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, like, what was the highest level ROI metric that you were attached to? As you went through this process, did the did your company say, hey, we, we can actually see the impact of mm -hmm. making TA more effective on our ability to drive revenue or be profitable? Yeah. Or was it sort of like halfway there where there was an operational efficiency metric or, you know, or, or was it like, hey, we're aware of all these business impacts, but we want you to really focus on a number that's still talent acquisition specific? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Ultimately, we looked at productivity, right? Like at the end of the day, we need to be able to deliver great talent so that the business can continue to run. And for us, it really looked at two primary components. One is how does our engineering and product team continue to hit um, milestones on the product roadmap? And then two, how do we make sure that we're growing our sales organization? They are able to turn out revenue. And so knowing that there were gaps or um, positions that were sitting open because the team wasn't able to deliver at the rate needed, um, we actually saw massive downstream implications to that, very real downstream implications to that. What was amazing is I started to reach out to other heads of talent and do some benchmarking exercises as we looked at how, uh, how do we stack up, how do we measure up, are our teams actually performing in the same great state that we think they are? Uh, what was amazing is we were, um, but we needed to be able to get more uh, efficient and, and productive. Excellent. Ryan, are there any questions that are coming in on this page? Because if there's not, I want to take it to uh, to the next part of the conversation. Yeah, we, Jason, we, we do have one. This question is, where do you start if the data doesn't exist? And, mm. are, there, and are there examples of metrics that we should be avoiding? Yeah, that's a great question. And quite truthfully, it was one of the things that we had to address ourselves, right? Like, just put it on the table and call out that the data isn't there. Um, and just understanding what our baseline is became a major OKR for us. That being able to tell the business, this is what uh, current state looks like was the first step. Be able to then look outside and say, okay, is this good, is this bad, are we on target, are we off target, um, became the second. And then we were able to put goals in place to be able to refine things like time to fill, um, hires per resource per quarter, cost per hire. Um, but just understanding what is the baseline, uh, quite, quite truthfully, that's a giant accomplishment, and you got to start somewhere. Uh, to the and then to the back half of uh, the question that came in, were there any false starts? Anything that you thought would be relevant, where after you measured it, you're like, mm, maybe not so much. Yeah, interestingly enough, we we spent a lot of time focused on cost per hire initially, um, and what was. Uh, intriguing about that is we had part of our organization that was still almost exclusively reliant on third-party agencies and so we had really high placement fees that were really skewing our cost per hire so just producing more uh, or working faster or cutting our costs elsewhere really didn't impact cost per hire that much because we didn't divest from reliance on third-party agency in one part of the business very interesting so let's so let's kind of take this um, mm -hmm. to the next step and, and get into uh, get into the next, the next part. Right. So you've identified you've identified needs. You've identified op opportunities for efficiency. Uh, you obviously have um, yeah. And Ryan, we're ready for the next slide. You've got some or all of the stack in place. It's just not quite right. Build or, or buy. Improve. Maximize what you have. Live with the pain. <laughs> Rip and replace. <laughs> Like, yeah. you, like what? Um, oh, and totally. I, I, so, so the first thing that I want to that I want to um, uh, ask about is you've already said you reached out to other TA practitioners to get mm -hmm. some benchmarks. So I know that you you weren't insular. You didn't stay within Medallia to do this. You you reached out. Um, let's just call it out. When people talk about practitioners and vendors. There's this, there's this assumption that the vendor's always going to sell and the practitioner's always going to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing from, from my vantage point of having seen this for 20 years is there are a lot of vendors who have really good knowledge because they see across organizations. And there's a lot of practitioners who they might be brilliant, but they're brilliant within the idiosyncratic world yep. in which they live. Yeah. So, how do you, how do you, who'd you reach out to? Where'd you get help from? And, you know, and, and you might, like, how do you control for that? Do you ever, did you reach out to just practitioners? Did you leverage vendors? What was your it's process? A, it's a great question. Quite truthfully, I did all of the above. And you're, you're spot on, right? When I, when I look at some organizations, um, I know that um, 
the way that they hire, the caliber that they hire are fundamentally different from Medallia. And so those benchmarks just won't ever stack up. And it's not that there's anything wrong or bad about it. It's just that their environment looks distinctly different from Medallia's. In the same regard, I know there are vendors who all they want to do is sell, and that becomes apparent quite quickly. Um, but there were a phenomenal number of vendors, consultants, um, organizations who had exactly that, like the wonderful best practices and insight across the entire ecosystem and multiple companies who were able to partner in a really effective way. Truly the big differentiator for me and for our team when we looked at, well, who do we partner with? Who do we want to uh, engage and seek insight from became, um, is this mutually beneficial? Right? Not just um, someone who wants to sell us something. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, and so, so let me ask kind of a different flavor of that same question. It's, it's a, uh, the idea of partnering is uh, very compelling, but I also have seen a lot of people kind of get to the precipice and then, uh, ooh, that's scary. I'm about to share some, you know, some yeah. real stuff here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, obviously, trust is going to be an important piece. Uh, how do you vet people, whether it's another practitioner or I don't care who it is, when you start going outside your organization, uh, you, Mike Podobnik, do you have a process for vetting or is there a group that you like to go to or do you have um, some key friends that you turn to that when you've got those dangerous questions that require a bit of a reveal um, mm -hmm. that you can turn to and, and you know, you know uh, what you share won't be, won't be used against you? Yeah, totally. Well, it was interesting for me because three years ago I actually moved to the Bay Area. So my entire career was, was really spent in Seattle, and so that was my network. So stepping into the Bay Area where I didn't know that many people, I started first and foremost with where I knew I could trust. For us, that was Sequoia. Um, Medallia's um, funding is led by Sequoia, and so it became a natural point for us to be able to turn back to and, and help with connection points uh, to other practitioners. Um, that actually helped really develop and foster a nice relationship that I could go back to regularly and from there we were able to expand out. And so there were a couple in particular that I talked with regularly who said, you know what, you should actually reach out to this person, this person, and this person. They have great insight that would benefit you. And so that, um, you call it a circle of friends, just continued to grow. And then in turn we'd tap other in, others in. So what's awesome is there is a um, handful of heads of talent right now that have a regular thread going on a pretty weekly basis of what's really happening within our business, what challenges are we facing, what opportunities uh, do we see, and when we think about new technologies or the stack or some of the common problems that we go through, it's a, it's a great litmus test to be able to say, hey, how is this actually working in, a, in reality for you, or um, you know, are you facing the same types of problems or issues? And what, so in, it, whether in that thread or what you heard as you went through this process, was there any pattern to the advice you got in terms of making the most of what you currently have versus starting fresh? Well, first and foremost, I think we're all dealing with very similar challenges. So it was nice to be able to really talk to a, a group of practitioners who understood uh, mm -hmm. and could empathize. Um, I think secondarily, yes and no, right? It depends on the... I guess it depends on the, the inflection point or where an organization is at. So for organizations that were really exiting hypergrowth and moving to scale, there were a lot of shared uh, similarities and issues and needs. And so we were able to talk through like, hey, this is a very real challenge that we try to uh, bolt on a CRM. Does this work with your current process? How is it tied into the ATS you have? Or do we, like, does it make sense to step away and start over? Mm -hmm. How painful is that? Uh... How painful is that RFP process when you do start over? Like, is that is that a meaningful part of the discussion, or do you find that the, the you process know, of buying is kind of like a real but hidden cost? It's it's a great question. It is right. It's it's painful in the sense that it takes time, and you've got to be able to build that in. But the reality is, my um, my knowledge is only going to be you know so great, and so being able to really take a very objective view as to um, my opinions aside what does Medallia need and where is their opportunity? It was really helpful. Now, in our case, when we went through the RFP process and we looked at what we really needed to change in our HR stack, what was awesome about it is we did actually end in the, the state that I quite suspected that we would. But we got an opportunity to do a very objective assessment of everything available to us in the market and what, uh, what might help us most. The other piece that was super helpful in that that I think is, is worth calling out is the switching cost is significant. Right, mm -hmm. 
just a different look and feel. It's going to take time to get comfortable, time to train, and, and you know, that's soft costs that you have to layer in. So we actually incorporated hiring managers, interviewers, um, kind of third parties into our RFP process to be able to help us make an objective assessment so that uh, what we were investing in uh, didn't just work for talent acquisition, it worked for the needs of Medallion. There was a very real conversation that we had with a, an interviewer and hiring manager who said, look, I acknowledge what this is going to take as far as training, switching costs, everything that goes into this. I can tell you in the you know, 30 minutes that I have spent, this is worth it. The trade-off is significant. Mm -hmm. And that was great to be able to hear. What did you tell him to get him to see the benefit? We didn't actually have to tell him anything. It was, look, think about Think about the uh, life cycle that you go through in recruiting. As a hiring manager, when you engage candidates, when you go back to market, when you assess, when you sell, when you close, all of the things that uh, come through end-to-end -end in the hiring funnel, does what we're looking at enable you to do that better, quicker, more effectively, more efficiently, or does it not? And if it doesn't, that's totally fine. If it does, then we have to assess, is that trade-off worth it? So when... It just thinking back to the bit, so the core elements of the of the stack, right? You've got your HRIS, your ATS, your CRM. What are there? Is there a part of that stack that is more interesting to areas outside of recruiting, talent acquisition? Uh, I think it depends on the part of the business. Let's take engineering, for instance. We know that um, Medallia is not a household name, right? If our product works the way that it's supposed to, our customers' customers don't even know that we're there. And it's amazing. It really is the magic behind. It candidate experience, or excuse me, customer experience. <laughs> I actually use it for candidates as well, which is awesome. Uh, it's, it's the magic behind CX. But from a recruiting perspective, it's really hard to differentiate Medallia from any other company out there. And so it takes time to not just identify, but then really engage and unlock a passive candidate. And sometimes that time may be, you know, not weeks, but months, or in a couple of cases, we've got examples of years. Mm -hmm. So in our case, from an engineering perspective, top of the stack and the understanding of being able to identify, report out, engage candidates through our CRM was super, super valuable. On the flip side, we have other parts of our business who really, really cared about the assessment component, being able to refine the scorecards within an ATS. Um, and then another is like finance to be able to couple the two and move from an ATS to an HRIS and be able to report out what's actually happening. So it was really an understanding of what matters most to each component of Medallia as a business uh, that allows us to say, like, okay, from this piece, uh, are we getting what we need? So would it be fair to say that, uh, that you, by engaging with different parts of the business, you took time to help them understand what the local benefits would be for them? Absolutely. Yeah. It, you know, it, I've, I've talked with, um, with a few people um, in a in a place and who have been stuck, and in hearing them talk now, I don't know what the internal conversations were, but in, in hearing kind of how the frustration was communicated to me, uh, the pattern uh, that I would see in, with companies that are kind of locked uh, and unable to move mm -hmm. forward, the head of talent seems to be really focused on benefits that are local to talent acquisition. Yeah and sort of unaware that the costs are global, the costs will hit IT and finance and there's change management for all your hiring managers and, and yet they haven't communicated any benefits beyond uh, efficiency within TA. And it sounds like you just took a different approach. Everybody shared in the pain, everybody shared in the gain. Absolutely. And I think you know, what was amazing about doing that is not only did we validate our opinion, but we learned too. Right? When we thought about the rollout, when we think about like what really are the pain points and do we have a good understanding, the more that we talked very openly about this, the more that we discovered um, like new opportunities for impact. And that too is frankly a lot of fun. So it also sounds like you didn't, you didn't go on a, on a sales tour. You weren't trying to convince people of a, of a solution. It sounds like you actually went on a tour to understand the pain points and jointly find a solution. Is that accurate? Lost you. Either either we lost you again, or you were so stunned by the question that <laughs> you're speechless. Yeah, it looks like we may have. He, he's still on the line, Jason. But we, we do have a question that came in. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, or if this is something that uh, Mike would need to uh, answer. 
Uh, we have two questions actually, and let me just uh, input the first one here. Give me a sec. What are some example questions that you can ask vendors or consultants when starting the process? And what happens so, if or when IT says it's too busy to implement any new tech? <laughs> Mike, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. Sorry, connection issues here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I caught the tail end of that question um, on IT being. I think one of the things that you've got to look at is across the system as a whole, who will be impacted? So in the, the conversation about replacing an ATS or changing our HR stack, we really had to look at how much time, effort, and energy this is going to take and start those conversations super early. So we mapped out, um, I mean, a good year and a half ahead of time. What are all of the components that we need to change in order and who are all of the people that we need to talk to uh, that will experience change. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Ryan, what was the first question? Yeah, the, the first part of that question was, or I guess a yeah, separate question here, what are some example questions that you can ask vendors or consultants when starting the process? And that was the, the first part of that question, Mike. Awesome example questions. Um, that's an that's a excellent question. I think an understanding of like, truthfully, what is the ROI by implementing changing, uh, tying in, like what is the true what is the true benefit? And what I always look for, are where are reference points? Who are others that I can speak with? Who are other practitioners who've had similar challenges that have experienced the benefit of change? That's been fantastic. In a lot of cases, we've taken that to the next step when we look at the. Um, the available solution systems, processes, tools, and done a lot of like very objective A-B testing. And so we'll do a stack up side by side and use the same control groups to be able to see is this actually playing out in the way that we think it might. Mm -hmm. And you know when um, when you dropped off, this kind of dovetails into what I what I wanted to drive at it. As you went internally, it doesn't sound like you were you had tested a solution and then were kind of selling it internally. It sounds like it was more of a listening tour where you were trying to uh, engage people to understand what the challenges for their departments were and then jointly find a solution. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, as you're A-B testing different technologies and you're getting some early ROI uh, data back, uh, did you ever have to go back to anybody and say, hey, you know what, we, <laughs> I shared it out, here's how the conversation changed, here's a new piece of information, now you know what happens to your results if we you know if we modify the experiment in this in this particular way. Um, was that part of the process? It was, in fact, and there was a, a very real instance that as we were looking at, uh, we'll take referrals for instance. When we thought about how we actually maximize referrals, um, increase participation, uh, systematize and automate in a way that we can again lift the administrative burden off of managing a referral program that grows. Um, we looked to two solutions in particular, and I was personally gung-ho about one of them, all in. Um, and as we did the A-B test and we were able to take away ROI and feedback, that opinion fundamentally changed. Now, had I just jumped with the gut instinct um, based on referrals or based on what we thought might be possible, we would have implemented something that, quite frankly, would have been rejected. Right? And so the idea of the body rejecting the organ, the more that you can avoid that with objective uh, analysis up front, I think the better your chance of success is downstream. That's fantastic. I mean, it, uh, yeah. it does have to go back to the point where like, you got to leave the ego at the door in that case, because I'd love to be right all the time, but the reality is I'm not. Well, it, so, uh, Ryan, if, if you could pull us forward one slide, that's actually a, a perfect segue just to this last, uh, this last topic, which I, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on, because I think you've actually, it's been this like, consistent undercurrent. Uh, Closing the gap between TA and the executive leadership, Mike, uh, leaving the leaving your your ego at the door. I, I want to ask you a specific question about that. Mm -hmm. You're representing talent acquisition. You're engaging all these other parts of the organization. How do you know if it's appropriate? Wait, at what point are you guiding them because you know talent acquisition better than anybody else? You're the expert. Versus when do you go? Huh, that's new. I was wrong. And and were you ever worried that you might lose credibility or lose control of the process by acknowledging that a gut instinct you had was, was not right? Oh, that's a great question. Um, 
know, truthfully, I think one of the ways to avoid that is just be open and vulnerable. And it sounds really cliche, but being authentic about the fact that I have a hypothesis, I feel good about this, I've got instincts, credibility, data to back it up, but I'm open to being objective if there's another outcome that we didn't think about. That allowed us to go so much faster in making decisions, getting support, and actually moving forward towards implementation. It went a long way. Um, and that's been something that I have uh, certainly learned throughout my career, that coming to the door with credibility, but um, being open to objectivity was huge. So you've talked about that in terms of who, you know, there's a lot of different groups that influenced the decisions. Mm -hmm. who, who was involved in the actual buying decision? In the actual buying decision, at the end of the day, uh, we had to work with FP&A to make sure that we had budget allocated. Which we stands for? Uh, <laughs> finance, essentially. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> so our finance partners, we had to work with our legal team to make sure that statement of work, MSAs, everything uh, that we had terms and conditions aligned to supported the needs of Medallion. Mm -hmm. We had to work with IT, so when we think about implementation and how do we turn a system on and make sure it works within our broader Medallia ecosystem from single sign-on to connection to other tools and resources to access globally. Um, and we had to work with our HR operations partners. When we think about the next step for us, we have in fact replaced our ATS. We've turned on a whole bunch of different components to our HR stack. The next step for us is actually integration with our HRIS and knowing that they had bandwidth and were supportive of that as a next step. Um, speaking of bandwidth, <laughs> uh, all of those organizations could get bottlenecked. Which was, oh, the totally. worst bot which was the worst bottleneck for you? Legal, finance, IT? That's a great question. Um, it was shockingly smooth. Um, I've done this a couple times. Uh, it was a distinctly different experience here. And I don't think it's unique to Medallia. I do think it's the fact that we did a lot of preview and talked through who will be impacted and who needs to actually make room uh, and understand the business case behind this. Doing that upfront, again, like it takes time. Um, but if you go to the old adage of like, go slow to go fast, mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is we've been able to go incredibly swiftly when the decision was made. So you, you mentioned, uh, you know, it's like a year and a half ahead of time that you started the planning process to understand what the needs were. In terms of the buying process, that's, that's a, a, you know, for a larger organization, that's a dual track. How far ahead of time did you start that process? Um, from the buying process, I think it was less than six months. Okay. What was amazing is, you know, again, we've got a thousand employees with a global footprint all over the world. So we did a lot of work up front to plan and prep. Uh, but we were able to go end to end in implementation in under two months. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it was record time. So it was, um, again, we had some wonderful partners um, externally. We had some great partners internally, but it really was making sure that everyone's on the same page, bought in, and that we're aligned in what is the outcome that we're driving towards and how do we really enable one another to do this as effectively as possible. Like, it so, sounds really silly to say, but just going back to that, like, hey, we're all on the same team, mm -hmm. uh, goes a long way. <laughs> so we've so just to I'm going to put a fine point on this part of the conversation and start it kind of back where we we started uh, with in terms of in terms of understanding the stack there's a there's a core knowledge there's no mystery there there's an HRIS an ATS a CRM in terms of the specifics uh, those those all shook out it sounds like based on the, the particular needs of uh, of medallion. So rather than saying, oh, video interviewing is mandatory or e-signatures are mandatory. No, it's, yep. your company's going to have a, a set of needs and you have to understand what those are. When we looked at this from an ROI perspective, you stepped back and you talked about the global impact to the organization and bringing others into the process. When we, when we talked about the build or buy decision, you took a step back and you talked about the impact on others and you know, and them coming to you and saying, yeah, I, we're in, they could see both the pain that they would, they would suffer in the change, but also the benefits that they would get, and everyone came to their own conclusions. And here, when we talk about closing the gap between talent acquisition and executive leadership, I'm hearing it again, and it really seems to be that the way to close that gap is just make your world big. Go outside of talent acquisition, engage everybody. Engage the different stakeholders inside the organization, talk to your peers, 
make those conversations transparent and visible so that everybody can kind of see what's going on. And, and you know, to the extent that you might be vulnerable by having those, keep everything very data and fact-based so that mm -hmm. you can have expertise but no ego uh, when it comes to uh, uh, you know, an analysis of the data and an actual decision. Do you think that would be a fair kind of summation of, of closing the game? It's a good synopsis, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, Mike, I think um, I, that's all the questions that I have for you. We've got a, we've got a couple slides um, to go. Um, so let me let me take those. Let me go through those and then hang tight. And we'll we'll do a little Q and A at the end to see what else has come in. Sound fair? Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Jason, we we did have a question come in during the slide here. Do you want to take that now, or do you want to hold off to the end? Uh, why don't we hold off there? Because I want to make sure we've we've got plenty of time for Q and A. Um, and this has been sort of a, a thematic uh, one. So let me let me do the obligatory. And, and this is um, you know it, it is our pleasure to actually bring uh, to bring the discussion to bear. And, and Mike, you you're a fantastic partner yourself. Uh, for those of you who are listening and wondering kind of who I am and and where my perspective comes from, uh, I work for Lever. We have a modern approach to talent acquisition. A lot of the things that Mike was talking about, we work very hard to address in the software so that uh, once it's implemented, it's it's smooth sailing, it's it's intuitive. Um, Ryan, if you take us forward a slide, I'm not one to read slides, folks can read them. Uh, but it, the, the approach we take is uh, actually much like was discussed, there's, there's some stuff that makes recruiting work smoothly. At the core of it is a hiring process that is intuitive uh, with software that disappears in the background and allows recruiters and sources to focus on relationships, whether it's with hiring managers or talent or, you know, or even within the department. Um, on the front end, CRM capabilities are key because I think, like to your point, increasingly uh, it just takes time. Uh, talent is going from people searching from jobs to more of a savvy consumer model where they need to be wooed and they need to be given a reason to join. And on the back end, you mentioned uh, you know, finance having a need. Analytics are key. And you know, so we've developed a suite that starts with CRM, goes through the hire, and then try to make sure that data flows in a very clean and smooth and consistent way so that you've got good reporting out to the, uh, to the rest of the organization. Uh, Ryan, let's go just one more. We've got, um, we're proud to have over 1,200 clients at this point, uh, some great brands using us. Uh, I'm privy to the Slack channel internally and see the love notes. It's, uh, it's some really cool software. I'm, I'm proud to be a, a part of it. And, uh, and let's just jump one more. So as we, as we wrap up, I'll leave the, I'll leave the, the, um, the reminder of our next webinar, which will be on May 10th up. Uh, Lou Adler will be talking about recruiting strategies. Um, and let's just let that sit. And we've got a few minutes left. And Ryan, let's take that question. And then if there's any others that come in, Mike, you and I can now jam for another uh, six, seven minutes before we have okay. the top of the hour. Sounds great. Good. So we've got a total of, let me just see, we've got one, two, three, four, five, and six questions. So. Just to give you an idea on, on time. Um, <clears throat> so this, this question came back in. I think it was around slide eight or so. Uh, please speak on... Because <laughs> we all remember what, what slide eight. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm sorry. What's the question? <laughs> so, right, so it's a question about the application process. Sure. Uh, please speak on universal applications versus applications customized to the role. Oh. Universal applications versus applications customized. Um, well, in the case of Medallia, we are OFCCP compliant. And so we will look at universal applications as a result. Now, I think the reality is we want to make the barrier to entry as low as possible. So that the candidate experience in applying for the, the job is positive, and the time that it takes is as few minutes as possible. Cool. Mike, you still with us? Yep. Can you hear me? Awesome. Sure can. Okay. Are we ready for the next question? That... Sure are. Okay. So, how, okay, so this is, I think this is just overall. How do you know that you're doing everything the right way? 
<laughs> Hold on. What? <laughs> is that a state? Like, is that actually possible to know that you're doing things the right way? <laughs> and if you, if you figure that one out, definitely tell me. Um, I, I think the reality is, I mean, quite truthfully, it's, it's continuous improvement. It's iterative learning and it's assessment along the way. We know that just like we've scaled, there are points when, as we put in our new HR tech stack, as we change our process, as we continue to grow, there are going to be points where we have to look back and continue to change it as well. But if you, I think, just sit idle uh, and expect things, processes, data to continue flowing in the same way it always has been, um, I think that's where you run into a mistake. Yeah, I, so I'm going to... I'm going to take a crack at that real quick too, and just say that question has to do with leadership. Uh, uh, if you, you know, if you're waiting, Mike, to your point, like if, if you're waiting for stuff to come your way, you're not doing it right. Uh, uh, if you are being proactive, fine, go be proactive. Go collect data. Go ask a question. Go make a mistake. Who cares? As long as you're moving forward and and not just making continuous improvement, but signaling to the organization that the the improvements will not stop and that you are open and hungry for then you're doing it right and you will eventually get there. It, the, the journey is real. There is no start and end. It is continuous. It is ongoing. You just have to be very purposeful and intentional and proactive about it. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, this is kind of a scientific process, right? You have a hypothesis, you test it, you gather data to see if you've been accurate or not, and you iterate as needed. There you go. And your hypothesis not, may not come true, but as long as you're open to that, I think that's what's perfectly acceptable. Curse you, no hypothesis. <laughs> Ryan, what's up next? All right, so what is more important to your team, process or technology? Well, that's kind of a double-edged uh, sword. Um, you know, truthfully, it's, it's both. I mean, I think technology enables, but process uh, does as well. So if we have the wrong process and the right technology, we're going to still get to the wrong end result. And vice versa is true as well. Yeah, the, the third leg of that stool is people. Um, you know, it's what I find, uh, and I've been on both sides of this, what I find is that water runs downhill. So if you have kludgy technology, uh, mm -hmm. good people will find a workaround, but eventually somebody's going to be a part of that who's not so good, and they'll bastardize the technology. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you have problems like bad reporting or inconsistent reporting. So there is a certain, you, you do need the tech, but you, you also need the people um, and you need the process and the refinements that you make, you know, as you adjust one, there should be a ripple effect to the other two buckets. Um, and if there's not, you're probably going to hit some sort of challenge downstream. Right. Okay. Good. And just to let everyone, we have one more question, but just before we get to that, we did open up a poll uh, for the webinar today. So when you see that on your screen, if you could just go ahead, go ahead and select uh, the option. We'd like to make sure everything is always going well and uh, everything is good on our presenter side so make sure you grade these guys accordingly uh, content and presentation uh, that's how we all like to get better uh, so what, one more question for, for you all what is working right now from a user adoption or a user satisfaction perspective oh um, that's a great question well, I think since we've implemented new systems, tools, and resources, that idea of continuous improvement holds true. We have a hypothesis that things work, but we're finding out that in actuality, in practical application, some things need to change. Um, and so working right now from a user adoption perspective, the idea of how do we shift our process to move faster? How do we enable um, better outcomes and data using the tools and resources that we've implemented? Um, from a user satisfaction perspective, it really is continually soliciting feedback, perspective, input from, again, the entire system, not just talent acquisition. Actually, um, Mike, yeah. there's, there's an additional piece. You haven't just solicited feedback, which would come after the fact. You solicited input up front. Oh, yeah. And I think that's, you know, I think it's critical to just highlight that, that um, in terms of what's working, I've seen this elsewhere, and I've heard it in you over the past hour time and time again. Early inclusion in the process, not just, hey, we're going to go solicit a bunch of feedback, and then we're going to spit back a report you know, in three weeks or six months, but ongoing dialogue, ongoing inclusion, ongoing updates, uh, you know, ongoing check-ins, uh, so critical 
uh, it, it changes people's perspective, makes them feel like they're a part of it, actually makes them a part of it, gives them a voice, and uh, you, know, you can still retain the decision. You, know, you can let people know, you're, you're, I'm making the decision, but I need your input here. Um, but um, it's not just feedback. It, it was that upfront piece, too, that, I, I, that caught my attention I think is so critical and, and sounds like you did um, a pretty good job with. Yeah, and I think that's where you get the interest and investment in the outcome. Right? If people are included along the way, that's where the outcome matters. And not just did you get it right or wrong and did you succeed or fail, but people are invested in making sure that you're collectively successful. Awesome. Well, and with that, I know we're at the top of the hour. Mike, uh, Mike Podobnik of Medallia, it has been a pleasure talking with you. You are a, uh, you're a, a great source of information. And I know the, the actual answer to the, the stack question, uh, kind of in that it depends category. We know the big buckets, but the way you broke down how you get to the specifics uh, was, um, uh, from my perspective at least, really fantastic. I loved the just how many times you hit on the need for open, transparent, regular communication and bringing other parts of the organization into the process. Uh, I think if, if people follow your read on that, they will um, <clears throat> not get it perfect, but they're going to do really, really well uh, with, their, with their process. Thank you very much for sharing all that. Thank you, Jason. Pleasure to be here. It is 